Thanks for checking out this movie review video. This is for the 1992 film Death Becomes Her, and it was a big one. Uh, I think it did relatively well in the theaters. It's a Robert Zemeckis film. Uh, I watched it on HBO Max, if anyone wants to know when I'm doing this review. That's where I watched it. Uh, we did one of our things where my wife and I watch a movie over the phone with some friends. And one of the big things that was said uh, that I was just like, oh, yeah, you know, you're kind of right. My buddy had said, um, it's very weird to watch a, an older film with Bruce Willis because he has hair. And I totally agree with that. It's so odd because we just kind of know Bruce Willis now as not having any hair. So it's just weird. But anyway, done by Robert Zemeckis, directed by... He did Monster House, Romancing the Stone, the Back to the Future films, Forrest Gump, Contact, and Castaway. That's just some of the more better known films that he's done. So obviously, huge career. This is one of the lesser knowns of the films that he's done. But one of the things I like about Zemeckis is he has this ability to capture uh, creepiness or scariness with a level of fun to it. There's like a playful a playful nature to it. And I think that's fully on display with Death Becomes Her. It's also in a film like Monster House, which is animated for kids, but his aesthetic is kind of that. Like when it's dark or it's creepy or it's scary, there's always still this level of fun and playfulness to it, which I kind of like. And that works really well for Death Becomes Her in particular because it's got a comedic aspect to it as well. And it also kind of, for people who aren't as much into horror, it kind of like takes that horror element and still presents it, but makes it a lot softer, a lot more digestible for people who aren't into horror. So this was written by Martin Donovan, who wrote scripts for a lot of TV shows here and there. He wasn't the biggest name on the script. The other person who worked on the script was David Kopp, who did scripts for Jurassic Park. I think he did revisions on Jurassic Park. Carlito's Way, Mission Impossible, Stir of Echoes, Panic Room, and You Should Have Left, which was his most recent. Those are, That's just a smattering, the more better-known ones and more horror-oriented for the most part. Uh, obviously stars Bruce Willis, but also has Goldie Hawn and Meryl Streep. So huge cast, especially at that time, and very accomplished actors. So obviously the acting is phenomenal in this film. And that's one of the things, like, it looks awesome. It looks amazing. Directing, uh, cinematography, acting, just all that stuff, so good. The effects were good, too, and I'll talk about the effects specifically in a second. This made some good money. It had a budget of $55 million, and it made $149 million, so nice for the studio who put it out. Uh, it was the first film to use computer-generated skin texture, and it actually ended up pioneering a bunch of their own of the effects that it used on this that would then go on to be used for Jurassic Park. So you don't get the level of effects for Jurassic Park without this film, which I think is a really cool tidbit of knowledge. During the shovel fight scene with this film between uh, Han and Streep, uh, Goldie Hawn's face was actually cut because they were using actual shovels and she got grazed at one point and she actually has a small, a light scar from that shovel fight scene, which I thought is interesting. And it's important to point out that even with bigger budget films that you would assume accidents aren't happening, accidents happen. Uh, it's a film set and some things can go wrong. Uh, so there was an original ending for this and I took a photo of it from uh, the website I got it from because I didn't want to just write the whole thing over because it was a lot. Okay, so most dramatically, uh, it was talking about things that were different in the film over the iterations of the script. The original ending was entirely redone after test audiences reacted negatively to it. The ending featured Ernest after he has fled Les... Lyles? Les... Les... Whoever... Isabella Rossellini's character. After he fled her party meeting a bartender who helps him fake his death to evade Madeline and Helen. The two women encounter Ernest and the bartender 27 years later living happily as a retired couple. Zemeckis thought the ending was too happy and opted for the darker ending featured in the final cut. Allman was one of the five actors with speaking roles in the film to be eliminated. Other scenes that were eliminated included one in which Madeline talks to her agent, <clears throat> excuse me, and one in which Ernest removes a frozen Madeline from the kitchen freezer he has stored her in. None of the scenes have been released publicly, but sequences can still be viewed in the original theatrical trailer. 
I thought that was interesting to note. So they they originally had a happier ending and went for darker, that which is uncommon when you screen films. Usually it goes more, people don't like the darker stuff, so you make it happier. So I thought that was interesting that it went the opposite way. Uh, this film opening with the musical sequence of um, Madeline singing in her, you know, what looked like a Broadway musical, um, I hate that beginning because uh, there's no quicker way to test the patience of your audience than doing an entire musical number right off the bat unless the film is a musical so i hate that start to it that is one of my big criticisms of this film is that's a boring as hell way to start it does not grab the audience it does not pull them in you need to start with something a little more attention grabbing so that did not happen the main conflict is quickly established though uh, as well as the mental state of helen's character uh, you know, the twisting of the cloth that she does when she's, you know, angry, uh, the, the facial expression she has, like she's like about to lose it. Uh, the time when she was twisting so hard on the piece of cloth that she started bleeding. I assume that's from her nails digging into her hand, uh, watching scenes on repeat of Madeline getting strangled in whatever movie she was watching. And then also just her living state. And, the, you know, she had packed on all those pounds. She looked like she wasn't taking care of herself. She was living with all those cats. Which the whole crazy cat lady stereotype is overdone and ridiculous and stupid. But I understand it was a thing back then. So it's just a part of it. But it's good that they established that mental state initially. Because you need that. Like, you definitely need to know who Helen is as a character. How obsessed she is. How she's not going to give up. And that obviously comes into play later when she's going hard at trying to get Ernest back, who I'm just going to call Menville because he was referred to more as Menville than anything. So I'm just going to call him Menville. The scene where Dr. Menville explains how, to, how he makes bodies look good with spray paint from the hardware store is A, an interesting one, and B, um, a good social commentary because the woman he's talking to had just told him, oh, you did such an amazing job making my, I think it was aunt, look good for the funeral. And then he tells her how she did it because she asks. And the fact that it was spray paint from a hardware store like made the woman appalled. And that's an interesting thing because that happens in real life where people just, they like the end state. But it's this kind of thing of like how the sausage is made. Like you love the taste of sausage. But when you find out how it's made, people really don't like it anymore. And they look at it very differently. It's the same thing with getting people beautiful cosmetically for funeral. Um, there's a lot of very intense stuff that goes into that stuff that if people knew they really wouldn't like it, uh, but they love the end state. And I think this, this scene in the film makes a really good point of that from a, you know, social standpoint. I love it. It's, it's a very good scene. Obviously strong foreshadowing comes in when the thunder and lightning hit as Madeline, you know, takes those two pieces of the card and kind of puts them together and realizes you know, I can't keep aging. I'm, I'm losing my mojo, basically, because she just lost her lover to a younger woman. Um, and she's obviously not even all that interested in her own marriage anymore, which she had stolen him from her friend. So um, it's a whole lot of cheating in this film. Uh, yeah, so, uh, but yeah, heavy foreshadowing. But in general, I think that actually uh, lightning and thunder is used kind of too much in this film because it's used to not just do foreshadowing but it's that kind of like you know bop you over the head with the foreshadowing type thing that kind of says hey audience we don't think you're really that smart we're going to not just wink at you but like wink at you and not stop winking at you until you acknowledge back to us that we're winking to you so I hate that type of filmmaking where they just assume the audience is stupid so they need to bash them over the head with things because that's how that thunder and lightning use comes in or how it plays out it, is it seems like that's what they're doing and I hate that. Glowing liquid, especially when it's exquisitely displayed, will never have a good outcome in the long run in film. Uh, although I do like how they made the liquid look. Uh, it's, you know, pink F, uh, glowing aspect is really really cool looking and also the little vial they have it in looks beautiful and then the the extra step where they kind of like have the vial sit upright on its own at one point very cool i do like it so design wise nice during this time period people with european accents were actually used a lot to kind of be villains in films 
and that's kind of seen with Isabella Rossellini's character. It's just this phenomena where all of a sudden, like, European-accented people just started being viewed as somehow not able to be trusted in movies, and that just became a trope, like a stereotype that just kept getting used over and over and over again. I mean, think also about, you know, going even further back, Bond villains. A lot of Bond villains had foreign accents, and that was one of the big things. It's like, oh, they're foreign. You know, you can't necessarily trust them. You know, your culture's different, so you don't know where they're coming from or what their motives are. So just, you know, just a uh, observation on that. The montage of showing the actions while Helen lays out each step of the plan that she's proposing for getting rid of Madeline is a really cool way to have things done. Uh, it's really nice because if you decide to go that route for the actual storyline, then you don't have to show the events again. You could just be like, oh, it happened and we're done. So it's kind of a bit of a time saver. But obviously with this, it, it's good because it shows you ideally how things were supposed to go. And then obviously it doesn't go that way. It goes totally different. So it, it kind of creates this good comedic aspect of here's the perfect plan. And you think that's the way it's actually going because they're actually showing you the scenes. And then you realize, oh, no, it got super screwed up. Um, so it's a little bit funny. I like that. The amount of time Madeline is almost falling down the stairs is insanely drawn out. Now, this happens twice because it's in, it's in the part where, you know, Menville decides he's not going to save Madeline and he actually pushes her down the stairs. And then when it happens at the very, very end of the film where I get, I think it's um, Madeline pushes Helen down and it, it mirrors the scene pretty much exactly. But I, I don't like that kind of cartoonish nature of it where it's not realistic at all. I understand that, you know, the premise of this film is not realistic in the beginning, but that the the potion is the only aspect of it that's not realistic. The whole, like, how physics work in the film, the fact that they're going to mess with that is, is dumb, because, like, her teetering, especially when you see the angle that her feet are at on the edge of that stair, it, it's ridiculous. Like, she can't balance like that for as long as she does. So I hate that scene for that reason. And then the fact that they use it the same way at the end. I think it's dumb. Uh, it's a good shot when it's focused on Menville and Madeline is putting her body back together behind him. I think that's one of those perfect moments I talk about where it's either scary or creepy, but also fun and playful at the same time. And part of the reason that plays out like that is the musical choices, too. It's more of like a fun, playful type sound, uh, piece of music playing at that point. Um, so I love that scene. Like you're seeing, you know, in focus, Menville on the phone explaining to Helen how things went wrong. And behind him over his shoulder, like blurred, you're seeing Madeline, you know, getting all of her joints back in place, basically finally standing up and getting herself together, except for, you know, her head being on backwards. Uh, good scene, really good scene. The scene with the doctor is really funny. I love that scene because the acting that the doctor does and how freaked out he is with the fact that he's seeing all these breaks and she has no pain and he just, like, he can't even fathom what's going on. And then the extra step of him going and then just taking a, a drink from the flask that Menville has, I think is is pretty a pretty good touch. I like it. I do think it's a little too far when they then show him having a heart attack because of it. I think that's a little too much. You don't need that. It doesn't do much. It's it's one of the, another one of those like overkill moments where they're bashing you over the head with things. The shotgun scene in this is awesome. When Madeline puts the shotgun to Helen's um, abdomen and just blows her away, it looks great. The fact that there's a giant hole blown in her looks really good. The fact that she goes flying out into the area where the fountain is and then lands in the water and then how all the blood just like slowly comes out below her. Awesome scene, a lot of impact, really fun, interesting looking. And then when you realize once she gets up and you're like, oh no, she also must have taken this potion. And now you have two women who basically embody death. Like they cannot die even though their bodies get broken down so insanely much. Uh, it becomes clear that the bad blood isn't really about Menville after a bunch of years. It started about stealing, um, you know, stealing boyfriends, basically. And then it became about Menville and the fact that 
uh, Helen became so focused on, I'm going to get him back, I'm going to get him back. But at the root of it, we find out after she, you know, after they've had their knock knockdown drag, drag out shovel fight, we found out that, you know, that's not the root of all the problems. And they finally do get to the root of the problems. They still can't really stand each other, but they're in the situation where they have to be together now. So they figure out how to make that work. But it's interesting because then at that point, it feels like Menville's not even that important to them anymore. They just need him around to make them look better because of his skills to use all that spray paint from the hardware store to match their color tone uh, of their skin and make them look decent forever. Obviously, he doesn't want to keep doing that, though. That sounds like hell. I know there are guys who fantasize about women fighting over them, but this shows how it can go really, really poorly. <laughs> um I, I don't, I've never understand, uh, understood that fantasy of guys being like, oh man, I wish two women would fight over me. No, I, it just doesn't seem good, especially because then you have to make choices and a lot of drama. Like, I just don't like drama. I only like drama in my movies, not in my life. There are some people who are just driven by drama and that's okay. Uh, you can tell Menville isn't going to drink the potion when he's kind of like, you know, hanging off the gutter over that big um, hole in in the uh, castle. Basically, it looks like a castle. You can tell he's not going to drink the potion because of how long they make the scene go. It's one of those things where if you're watching it from a standpoint of, like, really paying attention to the film and understanding that everything is for a reason, why would they focus on that scene as long as they do if he was actually just going to take the potion? Um yeah, you just know based off how long it's going. Yeah, there's, he's not going to take the potion at all. Now, what you don't necessarily know is that he won't die. So that was a good twist that you didn't necessarily see coming. And then obviously he gets away. He lives the rest of his life. Meanwhile, they're stuck because they were so vain and so concerned about their looks and aging and their mortality that they end up having a terrible life because this is... This is something that's been in film for a long time. The whole idea of immortality not actually being everything it's cracked up to be. And this is just another one of those films. I don't understand how they popped apart at the end like mannequins. I understand the idea behind it because when they were talking about using the spray paint to match the color tones for people who are dead, he said like they do for mannequins. And so I get that callback as a joke. But it doesn't make sense once again, much like the teetering on that stair before falling. Popping apart like a mannequin makes absolutely no sense because they're still held together like normal human beings for the most part. So I didn't like that. It kind of takes you out of things. It kind of, it, it's just absurd. It's once again another one of those like you, you went too far type moments and you didn't need to. It's a little too out of character for the actual story and just... It's just too much. You don't need it. Um, there's a point of how people try to defy aging in this film and fight off death with cosmetic surgery. And that's certainly a thing. It's very much ingrained in society. And a lot of that being that, you know, there's a, there's a large focus on people's looks in society. I think it's much less now than it has been in the past. And hopefully it continues to be much less um, because you know, being that vain is obviously potentially self-destructive, like this film is showing. And it also portrays as pretty dark and creepy, um, like the glimpse of the person getting that blood transfusion when she first goes to talk about options, Madeline. Um, they close the door and someone was in there, like, getting a blood transfusion and, like, this rotating circular thing. Like, that was creepy, like, real dark and creepy, and I felt like that was an intentional thing to kind of be like, look, cosmetic surgery is kind of dark and creepy. Like, if you think about it, it really is. Like, do you even know how they do nose jobs? That is brutal. Nose jobs are brutal. They literally, like, chisel cartilage out of people's noses. Like, I've seen some footage of it. i one time and I was just like never again like they literally have a hammer and chisel and just like r whack at the cartilage in the nose like it is violent <laughs> and terrible and then you consider that people are doing that just for looks just to maintain a certain look or to change their look Ooh, it's terrible so you know ultimately 
this is kind of speaking about the basic fear of mortality and with us being mortal as we age and we get closer to death our bodies breaking down and part of our body breaking down is our looks don't become as good you know do you think you know all of these uh lines in my forehead were there like 10 years ago or so absolutely not and that's just going to continue they're going to become deeper and more pronounced over time the lines that i have here that's another thing i didn't have these in my 20s i'm almost 40 years old like you know the fact that you know i'm going to end up like bruce willis at some point here you know it's that's what happens your body changes and not for the good it goes downhill continually until you die and this film just kind of takes that because everyone's afraid of that to some degree. And, you know, ultimately it's really about mortality, about dying, about getting closer to death. But it's also a little bit about not feeling like you have value in the eyes of society, especially when society ends up focusing so much on how you physically look and not who you are up here. Even though as you age, up here ends up going as well. So, you know. Anyway, uh, my thoughts on this film overall, with five stars possible, half stars in play, I think it's a pretty solid film. It's not the best. I already, you know, obviously gave some of my issues with it. I'm going to give it a solid three and a half star rating. I like it. I thought it was good. That was actually the first time I've ever seen it. Solid film. I could see myself watching it again. Um, I think it's fun to see what the characters are going to have happened to them next and then how they're going to try and cover that up and what that end product is going to look like. So, um, pretty, pretty fun film. Um, anyway, love to know your thoughts on it. Put some comments down there, but first I would really love it if you would go ahead and subscribe to my channel. If you haven't already really does mean a lot to me. Uh, this is my personal plea to help me grow this channel. And then if, if we do, I can do more fun videos, do more engaging stuff. And also, if you have ideas for horror-related videos, I would I would be open to that. So please hit that subscribe button. Um, also, make sure that you hit the notification bell at the same time because that'll let you know whenever you're putting up, whenever I'm putting up a new video, unboxing, movie review, or doing live stream. So, yeah. But regardless, I appreciate you taking the time to watch this review. And until next time, keep it brutal.